so the students consider themselves as the conscience of the people. That's one of the reasons why not only uh, the citizens of Peking, but uh, government officials and members of the security police were moved because the students use a language which is very deeply rooted in Chinese consciousness. They are not representing their own interest. They are really the voice of the people. In this half hour, a meeting of East and West with Du Wei Ming. I'm Bill Moyers. A world of ideas with Bill Moyers. Funding for this program is provided by the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, a catalyst for change. Corporate underwriting is provided by General Motors. General Motors, committed to excellence in its products and services and in support of quality television programming. Whether in mainland China to lecture at Beijing University or in his classroom at Harvard University, Du Wei Ming personifies the meeting of East and West. A student of modern thought and very much a modern man himself, his roots run back to Confucius, the philosopher of ancient China. To anyone who thinks Confucianism quaint or irrelevant, Du Wei Ming will argue that the humanism of the old sage can help us sort out some contemporary ethical problems. Ironically, it was in the West that Du Wei Ming rediscovered the tradition of the East. Now his own ideas have excited vigorous discussion back in the world of his birth. His family was living in Kuming, China, when Du was born in 1940. When the Communists came to power, the family escaped to Taiwan. At 22, Du came to the United States to study at Harvard, becoming in time a scholar of Chinese intellectual history, the author of five books on Confucian humanism, and an active voice in the dialogue on comparative religion. He is now a professor of Chinese history and philosophy at Harvard. Several times in the 1980s, he returned both to mainland China and Taiwan to lecture and listen. Before his departure for a year at the University of Hawaii's East-West Center, we talked at the Asia Society in New York City. Here we are on the verge of the 21st century with all the world's major religions being 15 centuries old and older. Do you think in this new era, these old faiths have anything to say to us? Oh, yes. Because they ask the ultimate, the ultimate question. They're not satisfied with our living as ordinary human beings, simply as economic beings, political beings, and social beings. They want us to be more. And in fact, we want to be more. It is in this sense that religion is both extremely powerful, explosive, and demanding. But can religions that for so long excluded, that considered non-believers as other, often persecuted them because they were other, can these religions find anything in common, do you think? It is a moral imperative that they share the common concern for the human condition. Because for the first time in human history, that whether human beings are a viable species is being questioned. Now, two very powerful forces emerge in, the, in uh, the 20th century. On the one hand, we become independent, interdependent. The global village is emerging. So a kind of global consciousness is considered absolutely crucial for anyone, any intelligent person to look at the world. Ecological issues, uh, nuclear annihilation, environmental issues, this all dictate an important, uh, the importance of uh, global consciousness. But at the same time, in the last 10 or 15 years, the emergence of a powerful search for roots, ethnicity, land, uh, language, so the mother tongue, uh, the fatherland, gender, and of course, religion is part of it. And I think we need to understand the interplay between these two on the surface contradictory uh, processes, the, the quest for interdependency and global consciousness, consciousness on one hand, and at the same time, this profound need for searching for one's own roots. To belong to that to which belong. is like us, that where we are welcome. Right. The tradition that I'm particularly aware of, the Confucian tradition, assumes 
that each and every human being is embedded, in other words, fated to be a particular human being in terms of uh, ethnicity, uh, gender, the birth, uh, the, the place you, uh, you were born, and your own socialization, and so forth. I think the, uh, the fascinating lesson in the Confucian tradition is to say how to transform our being embedded in a particular condition into potentiality and instruments for self-realization. Well, how do you do it, for example? You are Confucian. You're not living anywhere near your geographical uh, roots. Uh, you're, the culture from which you came has changed dramatically over the years since you've been gone. Your family is scattered, I presume. So, but you, you are still a practicing Confucian. In the sense that I'm capable of doing it, one thing is unique, probably, to the Confucian tradition. It's not a membership religion. So you do, be, you do not become initiated as a Confucian, as opposed to some other religious traditions. You get baptized into the into You don't the, have that Christian ritual. faith. That's right. Sometimes it's even wrong to say, I am a Confucian, in the sense that I am a cultivated person, or I am a scholar. Some other people may recognize you as such, but you don't make that kind of claim. Another interesting thing is, as a scholarly tradition, and it really doesn't have a founder, Confucius was probably the most important figure in shaping the Confucian tradition. But like Judaism, a lot happened before Moses. So a lot happened before Confucius. It's a scholarly tradition. It's a form of life. It's a way of learning to be human. Now, returning to your earlier question, if you look at China, not in terms of uh, just one geographic location, but cultural China, meaning not only mainland China, but uh, uh, Taiwan, uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, or Chinese communities in Southeast Asia, in uh, Australia, in New Zealand, in North America, and in, in Europe. These culture, this cultural China, many different people with different orientations, has been very much shaped by the Confucian project. Many people are not aware that they are Confucians, but they interpret their own uh, human condition. Uh, they live by some of the basic Confucian ideas, and they transform transmit some of these values to their children. It's in the cultural DNA in a sense. It's it? a cultural DNA. Yeah. It's a marvelous way of putting it. And in the sense that education is absolutely crucial for self-development. We are human beings to be sure, but learning to be human is an ultimate concern. I try to envision uh, the Confucian project as a faith in the improvability and perfectibility of the human condition through self-effort but not effort by isolated individuals alone, by the community as a whole. So you can in envision the Confucian process of learning to be human in terms of uh, a series of concentric circles. The idea of the self at the center, extending itself to the family, immediate family in particular, but to uh, other members of the family in the clan organization, to the community, to the state, uh, to the world at large and beyond. So to be human in this case assumes a responsibility which is not just social, it's even uh, cosmological in the sense that what human beings eventually will be able to do will have powerful consequences for the, um, for the ecosystem or for cosmos as a whole. What is the uh, notion of a good man in Confucian thought? A good man it's always a person who learns to become better. It's always in the process of uh, self-perfection or self-transformation. Very much in the tradition of, uh, say, Emerson or uh, Thoreau, the idea of person in the dynamic process of trying to transform himself or herself. How does one do that? How does one become better? One absolute, uh, absolutely crucial area is that humanity is understood as sensitivity or sensibility. It's not simply by the acquisition of knowledge from outside or refining one's uh, rational power, but also to train oneself to become more sympathetic, more open to other possibilities. So the point of departure for being human is empathy. It's empathy or sympathy. 
in that sense. Which mean? Which means to be able to experience the suffering of others and the joy of others. To know that one is not a loner, one is always in connection. Not only in connection with other human beings, but with uh, an ever-extending network with nature, uh, with ecosystem. But in the last century, Confucianism and, and the Chinese roots of Confucianism were so assaulted by the arrival of the West. Religion, military technology, the market economy, political institutions, and even now, in the birthplace of Confucius, the ruling principle is not uh, religious or ethical, but, but communism. It's not Confucianism, it's communism. So you're, but right. are you satisfied that the, this cultural DNA still is infiltrating the consciousness of the Chinese today, and that you can identify with it? Both yes and no. <laughs> and this, I think, it's a story not just unique to China, but I think it's a very important story for human history as a whole. The emergence uh, of the modern West with emphasis on science, technology, market economy, political institutions, and so forth, what I normally call a kind of enlightenment mentality, has shaped the universe in a particular direction. In fact, all the major spheres of values in the world today, all the important spheres of interest, are very much defined by the, uh, by the Enlightenment mentality uh, of the modern West. And in fact, uh, the Chinese intellectuals, uh, not to mention the Japanese and Korean, they are just as affected and influenced by this mentality uh, as uh, many of the other intellectuals uh, in other uh, communities. So it has become a common human heritage. The Chinese intelligentsia, whether communist or non-communist, in, in, in a sense, is being very thoroughly westernized in that sense. But this particular, particularly powerful mentality also has sort of pushed humanity to the brink of uh, self-destruction uh, with the uh, the danger of the destruction of the uh, ecosystem as a whole. You mean the Western? If it, is, if it is narrowly understood as wealth and power. I started to say that you mean the Western notion of the, the acquisitive, possessive individual. The social Darwinian, the Faustian drive to uh, conquer. And to get rich. To get rich, uh, to become powerful. I think when Bacon defined knowledge as power, which is a major departure from the idea of knowledge as wisdom, either in the Greek tradition or the Judaic tradition or in the Confucian tradition. So something very fundamentally changed in the human mindset conditioned and defined by this very powerful force so this of modernization. Idea, this idea of the individual and the aggression toward nature, you say, is, 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 is undermining our life support system. That's right. This, of course, does not necessarily mean that the, the Confucian tradition has been totally undermined in terms of uh, the form of life patterns of human interaction, understanding of uh, authority, of leadership, of education. Many of these things continue to develop and even flourish, not necessarily in mainland China, but in Taiwan, in Hong Kong, in uh, Southeast Asian Chinese communities, in Chinese communities in North America. Well, East Asia has moved to social Darwinism, it seems to me, as if it were the only game in town, and Eastern Europe threatens to become, to, to be, be there right after them. Uh, I don't see a lot of evidence in Eastern Asia, and I'm an outsider, of course, that, that they're holding on to those traditions. In fact, they seem to have grabbed the capitalist appetite uh, as their own with a vengeance. But that does not necessarily mean that at a very deep spiritual level, they've accepted the social Darwinian mode of thinking or way of doing things as uh, self-evidently true or even as meaningful. It's something you have to do, but it does not necessarily mean that uh, it will give you the ultimate meaning. The Marxists in your country, your native right. country, uh, have looked upon Confucianists as ghosts and monsters to be slain every time they rise. But I understand that your lectures in China and the articles that you've written for Chinese journals have been instrumental in starting a, uh, in putting the Confucian question back on the agenda in, in China, that the, that the communists are unable to uh, slay these monsters and ghosts. The question is complicated by the fact that some people believe that the problem in China today, the actual uh, issues concerning the political culture in China, 
are somehow connected with uh, the confluence of two traditions, Confucian feudalism, with too much emphasis on the group, on authority, on uh, artistic concern, hierarchy. on rituals, and so forth, and the Stalinistic notion of dictatorship. So the marriage of these two forces constitute the, China, the brutality of the Chinese regime. And even though my sense is that description of the Confucian project is too restrictive, I think they are basically right. That's a problem. That's one of the reasons why Confucian culture, the negative, negative side of Confucian culture, needs to be critiqued, analyzed very thoroughly to understand, uh, so to allow the more positive side that we've been discussing here to emerge. Now, friends of mine who have lived in China say that as beautiful as the Confucian idea is aesthetically in terms of form and ideality, uh, it is nonetheless very stifling in practice because the free spirit of the West does not feel at home in this network of, right. of, 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 of kindred ties That's and right. father and son and right. husband and wife. You just That's get smothered in this well, tissue. You can, you can also say that about a highly ritualized society of South Korea yeah. or Japan or even Vietnam because these are all societies under Confucian influence. So Westerners admire the tradition from afar but when they get there they feel smothered. That's right. But I think that's not ought to be the case. That ought not to be the case in fact. Simply because there's a major difference even in traditional China the debate has been going on between the Confucian idea of five relationships and the Confucian idea or the obligation of the three bounds. We know the Confucian idea of the three bounds is the, um, the authority of the ruler over the minister, the father over the son, and husband over the wife. So you have all these things we are fighting against by the feminists in terms of uh, male orientation, by, of course, uh, the, the uh, uh, liberal democratic thinkers in terms of authoritarianism, and by some scholars who think that the primordial tie between father and son will have to be overcome for the ego to be fully developed, you know, not, to, not necessarily in the Freudian sense, but in a very broad psychoanalytic sense. But the five relationships, as we understand it, really talk about the mutuality in terms of basic dietic human relationships. The relationship between father and son is defined in terms of affection, ruler and minister in terms of rightness, husband and wife in terms of division of labor, friendship in terms of trust, and sibling relationships in terms of sense of sequence. So I think within the Confucian tradition, you have the major conflict between the five relationships defined in terms of mutuality and support, and the three bonds as a kind of uh, mechanism of ideological control. Well, let, let, let's stop right there, because what I hear you saying is that Confucianism promotes the three bonds, ruler over subject, father over son. Politicized Confucianism right. as an as a ideology, ideology of control. All right, and father over son, and husband over wife. At the same time, it promotes the five relationships which are a counterforce to those original right. uh, uh, impulses, right. but, which is a way of saying that every religion contains the seeds of its own contradictory oh, yes. division. Yes. So what I see is within the Confucian tradition, the continuous struggle and conflict between one type of force, especially the political leadership, that wanted to use the Confucian ethical ideas for mechanism of ideological control. What is happening now? We have to be patriotic Chinese, don't criticize the government. We have to be obedient, we work hard, we try simply to uh, follow the rules and uh, do not raise any kind of uh, rebellious questions. On the other hand, there's always been a major tradition in, the, in Confucian humanism. Uh, that is to understand politics, not simply as a distribution of power, but to try to moralize politics. Try to argue that only the people who are exemplary teachers ought to be politically influential. Teachers? So, how to moralize politics has always been a major concern of the Confucian intellectuals. And how to use Confucian ideas or ethics to develop a stable society 
has often, often been the concern of uh, those who are in power in East Asia. So we even see that uh, uh, going on today. Uh, before the uh, Tiananmen massacre, many of the students who mobilized themselves in arguing against the current regime, first they didn't evoke any Western ideas of democracy or freedom. They basically talked about the public accountability of the government. They talked about corruption of the government. They focused their attention on the inability of the government to develop itself as really uh, the leader of, of the land. So the students consider themselves as the conscience of the people. That's one of the reasons why not only uh, the citizens of Peking, but uh, government officials and members of the security police were moved because the students use a language which is very deeply rooted in Chinese consciousness. They are not representing their own interest. They are really the voice of the people. Is that Confucian? Is very it? deeply rooted in Confucianism. Because Confucian. the intellectuals are supposed to be the eyes and ears of, eyes the, of the people. Of the people. And also this uh, very old saying that heaven sees as the people see, and heaven hears as the people hear. And if the intellectuals, which always constitute a very small minority, if they manage to articulate the voice of the people for the well-being of the society as a whole, they in fact perform an important function, not only social, but cosmic, in the sense that uh, they help the people to be able to um, raise their concern. And the government will have to respond to that particular kind of challenge. The paradox, though, is that uh, the intellectuals who still, as you say, are espousing or at least revealing this tradition in Confucianism are a minority. The party runs China, and the party is mostly peasants and military and That's workers, the, case. Uh, the illiterates of China. That's precisely the situation. So reality is frustrating the Confucian tradition there. On the other hand, the other side, the sinister side of Confucianism, with emphasis on authoritarian control, obedience, all these ideas, don't use any kind of Western ideas of democracy or human rights and so forth. You should exercise your duty, because duty consciousness has always been pronounced in the Confucian culture, whereas rights consciousness up to this day has never been fully developed. What do you mean, the duty consciousness? Duty consciousness, meaning that you have to prove you are a worthy member of the, uh, um, of the community as a whole to be able to voice your demands for certain kind of rights and ideas. As over and against the right, which say, I have this right to say No this. matter what. Yeah. Right. Now, what we have in China, the tragedy is this. The students, overwhelmed by the uh, irresponsibility and insensitivity of the regime, using all these traditional symbols of patriotism, loyalty, filial piety, and so forth, to crush them. They became totally westernized. Therefore, the they Statue could, of Liberty was a, of an liberty. expression of that. They just yeah. couldn't see the powerful forces within, even though they use it. They couldn't see that, so they became totally westernized. And in so doing, unfortunately, they gave some of the most powerful weapons to their adversaries. Because even the workers, the peasants, they couldn't fully appreciate what the students are, are striving for. But they could now hear the kind of inauthentic, but still persuasive, quote, politicized Confucian voice, which is obedience, duty, commitment to the, to the goal of socialism, and so forth. So unless a fruitful interaction becomes possible between liberal democratic ideas on the one hand and the indigenous resources in Confucian culture as a defining characteristic of the mode of protest of the students, the future of democratic movement or democratization movement in China is still quite bleak. So there has to be a fusion. A the, fusion. Something of the West, but not so much of the West that it overwhelms the indigenous... It's not in even, even just the conflict between the West and China. It's really uh, a fusion uh, at many different levels. Now, we may have to say the repertoire for human survival in terms of symbolic resources will have to be extended beyond the Europe-centered mentality, despite the fact every one of us, I myself very much included, is a beneficiary of this mentality. I think more like a Westerner than like a traditional Confucian uh, scholar. No, no matter how I, I try to uh, tap 
uh, spiritual resources from my own tradition. I'm critically aware of that. And also I share that idea with many other scholars uh, in China and Japan. So we are beneficiaries of the enlightenment mentality, of rationality, of science, of technology, of uh, the market economy, of democratic institutions. But we're also critically aware that the Europe-centered mentality is limited. There are great resources, not only in Hinduism, Confucianism, Taoism, um, but also in American Indian spirituality, Hawaiian spirituality, Pacific Island spirituality. These will have to be tapped. Look into the 21st century. What are some of the symbolic resources we have to tap into in order to formulate an integrated, coherent, humanistic vision? From the Asia Society in New York City, this has been a conversation with Duwei Ming. I'm Bill Moyers. I don't know whether uh, you have uh, questions. I can uh, probably entertain a couple of questions, then I would uh, continue with, uh, with the story. Do you have uh, any questions? You may have, you may have to uh, shout a little bit, but uh, do you have any questions? Yes, please. Yeah, I think part of the course will be uh, dealing with that particular issue. Uh, within the Confucian tradition, there's a great deal of emphasis on the uh, five relationships. And the five relationships are all reciprocal. Uh, the father, son, or the parent-child relationship should be based upon affection. The parents should be loving and the children should be respectful. Even the husband and wife relationship, it's based upon mutuality division of labor. The ruler and minister relationship based upon righteousness or rightness. The ruler ought to be considerate so the subject would be respectful. Friends based upon trust and the older siblings and younger siblings based upon a sense of sequence. But the three bonds which uh, evolved in Chinese culture over a very long period of time uh, I would consider them a uh, highly politicized Confucian ideology, which has been wrongly cr critiqued in uh, modern Asia. That is uh, the authority of the ruler over the subject, the authority of the father over the son, authority of the husband over the wife. So that kind of Confucian orientation, which is male-dominated, which is uh, hierarchical, paternalistic, and also authoritarian. So within the Confucian tradition, you have to struggle against the highly politicized patterns of control, ideological control, and to open up new possibilities so the reciprocal relationship can be restored. I think that's one of the uh, uh, major, major debates going on. Uh, any other questions? Yes, please. Yes. What do you mean by self-realization? Uh, it is not uh, totally individualized. Self-realization actually means the, f the full realization of one's potential as a human being. But since the Confucian tradition puts more emphasis on the idea of the moral person, so the full actualization of a human being is related to our sense of uh, the highest aspiration of being human. L let me give you one example. In the book of Mencius, there's a, there's a statement that if a person is very good, it's pleasing for us to be with him or her, and then we consider that person as a good person. But unless that good person has some substance, and that substance we have to take seriously, a good person is not necessarily a true person. If the substance of the good person is not just a little bit, 
but quite substantial, then we call that person a beautiful person. But if the substance of that beautiful person radiates outward, you can have a sense of the presence. Then you call that person as a great person, so the awe-inspiring. But uh, if the great person who, who does not necessarily uh, show the grandiose self, the great person transforms in a very gentle way, then we call that person a sagely person. If the transformation is mysterious, it's difficult for us to detect how it's done, then we can even call that person a spiritual person. So self-realization is to, to move from simply be a good person to a true, to a beautiful, to great or sagely. That infinite process of self-transformation. It's very different from our ordinary psychology. Our ordinary psychologists say how we try to be normal. To be normal, that would be considered as an achievement. Indeed, it is an achievement. But most ethical religious traditions ask us to be more than simply normal, more than simply good. How can we move beyond that? I think self-realization, in a sense, can be understood in terms of different stages of uh, character building or personal development. Maybe one more question? Yes. I will repeat your question. Yeah. How do you get to the point where you're radiating that? <laughs> How do you get to the point where you're radiating? I think only you know it. But uh, I think the, uh, the notion is that we need to give us time. In other words, this notion about self-development is also seasonal because it's an agricultural model. You have to grow according to the sequence. You shouldn't try to hurry it up. There's a, st there's a statement about a farmer in the state of Song who's anxious to have, to have his crop grow. So every day he tried to pull the year of the crop a little bit instead of simply put the, uh, uh, put the fertilizer or the, uh, you know, or the water to allow it to grow naturally. So after a few days, the plants certainly just withered. So you have to have a seasonal process of growing and you don't have to worry too much about your presence. In it. You, you, what you need to worry about then is, is the notion about self-learning. Learning is for the sake of the self. Am I doing this simply to enhance my ability to become successful in the, work, in the market, to be successful in politics, or this is doing something really for myself not just being satisfied with my emotions, but also for the sake of the development of my own character. I think this is very, also very Greek. It's not just, uh, just confusion, it's also very Greek. Now, let me uh, uh, continue very briefly. We only have a few moments. First of all, it's rather intriguing for me to uh, to realize that in the 18th century, some of the most brilliant minds in the West, in France, in England, in Germany, were so fascinated by China and fascinated by Confucianism, they wondered why a civilization that was totally radically different from the West, in fact, could flourish, could develop, in some way could serve as a good reference, a good mirror for the West. So that's 18th century. That 18th century fascination of some of the most brilliant minds in the West, such as Voltaire or Leibniz, was actually the consensus of most of the East Asian intellectuals. Of course, in pre-modern society, these intellectuals were male and educated in the Confucian classics. They just assume what we're going to talk about in this course as self-evidently true, as the way to develop an educational system. Family ethics is absolutely necessary for social stability. And the Confucian ideas are essential for normal social conduct. And governance or leadership always means moral leadership as well as leadership based upon your right policy, your right decision. So the idea in the great learning, for example, you need to first cultivate yourself then the family will become uh, regulated. If families become regulated, then there will be stability in society, and the stability in society is the basis of governance. If each state is able to govern it well, 
with uh, stable families, with uh, stable societies, then there's universal peace. It's a, a very common, from our point of view now, simplistic notion about the move from the person to the family, to society, to the state, and to the world. And everybody accepted that as uh, something, something basically true, with emphasis on harmony of society rather than competition, consensus formation, and all these other normal Confucian ideas. The emphasis on filial piety, that's deference to one's parents. The emphasis on commitment to the social norm. And yet in the 19th century, the West changed dramatically. The dynamism of the West is such that in the 19th century, most of the Westerners believed that the dynamism of transformation of the world was in the modern West. No other civilizations, China, India, the Islamic world, or any other civilizations, will make a difference. The real difference will be made only in the West. Of course, more recently, not just in Europe, but also in North America. Curiously, overwhelming majority of the East Asian intellectuals also accepted it, accepted this uh, narrative this description of the situation as true. And therefore, all civilizations will have to adjust to the dynamism of the modern West. So the coming of the West to Asia totally deconstructed this naive faith in social cohesive, cohesiveness based upon Confucian ethics. And the Confucian ethics, instead of considered by, the, uh, by some of the leading minds as the, uh, the way to handle basic human relationships, handle the relationship between individuals and community, or the relationship between human species and nature. They considered Confucianism as a negative example. The negative example, these are true description of the situation, the negative examples of Confucianism surfaced. Confucianism became too authoritarian, too much emphasis on status, hierarchy. Too much emphasis on the male rather than the population as a whole. It's too paternalistic. And the rules of the game defined in terms of not just wealth and power, but progressivism. Human history progressed from a harmonious sort of a primitive communism to feudalism eventually to the bourgeois society and to capitalistic system and to socialism. That, that progressivism rendered Confucianism as a rather naive, outmoded idea about harmony, consensus formation, and human relationships. And the emphasis on science and democracy, emphasis on the, the energy of the people need to be released, the individual rights of the people ought to be respected, and the emphasis on uh, competition, the survival of the fittest, you know, social Darwinian notion as absolutely necessary ingredients of social dynamism. All these emphasis rendered Confucianism as the feudal past, as something that's outmoded, it's gone. Ever since uh, 1919, with the May 4th movement in China, some of the, the most influential minds in, in China turned their back to Confucianism and, and consider that past, that, that heritage, is no longer relevant in the modern times. But some situation occurred in the last 30 years. And these new challenges made us first question the most powerful modern ideology in the world what I call the enlightenment mentality, with emphasis on the human capacity to not only change, but dramatically restructure the, uh, restructure the world. That is a form of secular humanism. Still, secular humanism is a very powerful force because of the emphasis on science and technology, human rationality. The notion that through certain kind of social engineering, we, members of the human community, will be able to take advantage of the resources of nature, 
we really don't have to worry about the spiritual realms at all because we as humans are able to handle our world if uh, our science progresses, if our political system becomes more refined, if the, uh, the market force, which is the dynamic process of change, were able to help us to reorganize our, our priorities. But in the last 30 years, this particular faith in the transformability of the human community through science and technology, democratic institutions, and dignity of the individual have encountered major challenges precisely from two areas. One is the whole question about ecology, as I pointed out time and time again. Now, which means that it is not enough for us humans to be anthropocentric. We cannot just focus our attention on the human community per se for its, for its own well-being, for its own survivability and own flourishing. If we have a longer perspective, the question is always what, hap what will happen in terms of the future generations. Now, this is a very moving proverb in, uh, in Africa which says, the earth is not entrusted to us by our ancestors as our heritage. The earth is entrusted to us by numerous future generations as a precious gift that we have to preserve not only for ourselves but for them. So that, that sense of intergenerational communication, the sense of going beyond the human-centered universe and to recognize the relevance of nature, the relevance of even the spiritual realm for our existence forces us to come up with a different kind of sense of humanity, different sense of what is, the, what is a human being. And the other one which is a surprise to many of us is that in the 21st century all the major religious traditions in the world, the major religious traditions continue to develop and flourish. It is inconceivable with a, with a view toward the future that uh, uh, all the major traditions, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, Jainism, Buddhism, will simply just fade away. They still very much shaped uh, the meaningfulness of our world. The German philosopher, I quoted him again, uh, Kai Aspers, in 1948, talk about these great paradigmatic personalities, uh, Socrates, Buddha, Confucius, and Jesus. In that particular description, he simply noted that the Greek tradition, which of course ancient Greece is no longer part of our lived world here and now, but the Greek tradition with Socrates, with Plato, with Aristotle, continued to inform uh, the rational mode of thinking inform how we understand our world. The Christian tradition, of course, by implication, the Judaic tradition, and we should also add the Muhammad and Moses, the Judaic tradition and the Islamic tradition continue to inform the meaningfulness of our world and the Buddhist tradition. Now, in this pluralistic tradition, how are we going to come to, come to terms with uh, both diversity and community becomes a major challenge. Not only how we're going to relate ourselves to nature, but also how we'll be able to live in our own faith community, but recognize the significance of other religious traditions, pluralism. Because these two challenges, we begin to explore all kinds of cultural resources for the development of a global ethic. It is in this sense that Confucianism, many of the ideas that the scholars in East Asia considered, because of the influence of the West, considered somehow outmoded, resurface as important challenges for our understanding of our world. So it is in this sense that the quest for universal ethics forces us to look at what normally call Asian, but we say Asian Confucian ethics not just the importance of liberty, but also distributive justice. Not just the importance of rationality, but also sympathy and compassion. Not just the importance of law and due process of law, but also idea of civility. 
uh, not just the importance of the idea of human rights, of course they are important, but also the question of human responsibility and duty. And of course, I need to uh, explore this with you, whether we should understand our persons as centers of relationships, or should we simply understand our persons as isolated individuals? And how, in what sense, the dignity of the individual as a person is not at all incompatible with the notion that we are members of a community. Now these are central issues for us to understand how, how the world actually functions. It is in this sense that I think uh, it is inevitable that we need to enter into a new dialogue. And in this new dialogue, the Confucian values, some of them we can call disvalues, uh, negative aspects of Confucian values, will have to be thoroughly critiqued. Critiqued from a human rights point of view, critiqued from the point of view of democracy, of liberty. But at the same time, some of the Confucian ideas of human relatedness, of network, of consensus formation, of harmony, of continuous stability, of the importance of orderliness, these new ideas will have to be also brought into the picture for a genuine dialogue between East and West. Okay, thank you.